Thank you for joining us for our water webinar, Measuring Open Channels Flows. We greatly appreciate the questions which were submitted. If you have further questions during the webinar, please utilize the chat or question and answer functions within Zoom. This webinar will be recorded and a video will be made available in the next few days. Our presenter today is Daryl Kuda, Teledyne ISCO's Business Development Manager. With that, I will turn it over to Daryl. Good morning. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, we had a lot of great questions that came in, and so I'm going to try to address all of them. Uh, so we're going to talk about the open channel flow measurement today. So what is considered an open channel? Open channel is defined as a flow in any channel in which liquid flows with a free surface. It can be a rectangular channel, round pipes, uh, streams, sometimes occasionally full pipes, and through primary devices, such as uh, weirs and flumes. So what are some of the challenges in uh, calculating flow in an open channel? We're going to discuss uh, how you can calculate the flow rate, uh, the uh, application, does it have enough up and downstream uh, uh, room to uh, get at uh, uniform flow, and uh, what technology should we use? So what is needed to measure open channel flow? You need a primary device, which could be a weir, that could be a flume, and then you need a secondary device, which would be a flow meter or a flow logger. But first, let's talk a little bit about a weir. So what is a weir? It's a dam built across an open channel in which liquid flows over it. So we are concerned about the water going over the top of the weir. Um, a weir provides a flow rate that is proportional to level, and you may have seen a different variety of shapes for weirs, which could be a rectangular, a V-notch, trapezoidal. Uh, these are all different uh, weir shapes. But let's take a closer look at the weir. Uh, so as far as the uh, sensor placement is one of the uh, bigger questions I get on uh, where I should read the level. And where you, should, where you uh, measure the level from is we have the uh, head measurement point, which is two to three times the maximum head head height of water going over the top of the weir. And that's going to be determined by what your expected flow rate is through that channel. And why that's important is that if you have the sensor uh, too close to the um, weir wall, uh, there's a drawdown effect. And as you can see with this uh, drawing, it uh, draws down and the level could be a little bit lower, closer to the weir wall, which would then give you a calculated lower flow rate. So how high should the uh, weir wall be? Uh, it should be uh, two to three times the uh, minimum head height, which uh, will be determined by the expected flow through that channel. And a couple of things, we want to make sure that the weir wall is high enough that we get a free flow over the top of the weir, which uh, creates some ventilation on the opposite side of the weir. Now, as far as when uh, measuring flow or head height with a weir, we are concerned about the water going over the top of the weir. So that uh, where it says the maximum head height, that's the water that we're concerned with going over. Um, so when you do a level measurement, you uh, determine what the weir height is, you would measure the overall depth and then subtract the height of the weir wall. And then that would give us the level uh, of the flow that's gonna go over the top of the weir. Uh, as far as the uh, straight run in front of a weir, it should be uh, 20 times the maximum head height that you expect to see over that weir. And it, as far as the uh, more straight run of pipe you have upstream or channel, the better, because what we're looking for is a uniform flow um, going through, through or across this weir. Yep. So as far as uh, uh, next, we want to talk about the calibration of uh, partial flumes. But first, let's just uh, discuss so. Uh, what makes up a flume? Uh, so a flume provides a flow rate proportional to flow, similar to a weir. Um, it restricts the flow to accelerate the water going through the throat of the flume, which makes it a little, uh, somewhat um, uh, um, self-cleaning because of uh, the accelerated velocity going through that flume. Uh, that doesn't mean that it, uh, 
it's the maintenance free, but it does uh, uh, reduce the amount of maintenance needed uh, when you use a weir over a flume. But there are three parts to a flume. You have the converging section is where the water comes into the flume. The throat section, that's where the water is accelerated through the flume. And then the diverging section where the water exits the flume. Let's take a closer look at that. Uh, so I have people call and ask, you know, what size flume I have. And to determine that, you measure the width of the throat, and that will determine the size of your partial flume. Where you take your level measurement at is H sub A, which is going to be two-thirds the length of that uh, weir wall. Uh, you can reference the ISCO flow data handbook. They'll show you where that point is or contact your manufacturer. Um, when you order the flume, a lot of times they'll put a ruler or staff gauge at that location or make a mount for your sensor uh, to make it easy to identify where to take your level measurement from. So here's a look at a partial flume with an ultrasonic sensor. Uh, the primary devices are weirs and flumes. The same level sensor can be used with both, uh, with a weir or a flume. Um, so with a, a flume, the flow calculations are based on level. So the, we take the level, we apply it to a formula depending on what size or type of flume you have, and that will give us a flow rate. So flumes are good for free flow applications because they have the assumption that the water is go, always going one direction, free flowing through the channel. It is unable to de detect reverse flow. So in a little bit, we'll talk about other options if you do have reverse flow. And if you have reverse flow through a flume, you do have bigger problems to worry about. So in this example here, um, you know, Having an improperly sized uh, flume or debris going through a flume can cause problems. So as the picture shows, we've got water backed up through that flume. Uh, water is still coming out the other side. So some maintenance is required with this. Um, and uh, what you'll notice is that your water level is going to go up. Your flow rates are going to be higher than expected. And uh, so this flume is backed up due to debris. So what, what would you expect through this? you're still going to get a flow rate reading, but it's going to be much higher than the actual flow going through there. Um, but what are your options on this? One, set up a regular maintenance schedule to clean the flume out. Uh, or two, have an alarm set that if it ever gets to a maximum flow rate, somebody needs to go out and inspect it. Or the other option is to put an area velocity sensor upstream because an area velocity sensor will read the level and the velocity. In this case, it would read a high level, but almost zero velocity to give us an accurate flow rate. So some tips for calibrating. One, you can use a staff gauge, or when you order your flume, uh, they'll put a, you know, a ruler or sticker on the side of the flume that has uh, the level measurements. You could calibrate your level uh, to zero with no flow. This would be your most accurate way to do it, although it's uh, usually not practical to stop flow going through a flume. You can use a stilling well. Stilling wells are a great way to measure the flow because you don't have the, the velocity of the water going through that could ride up on the ruler. And so you have the stilling well on the side. It makes a nice, easy place to get an accurate level measurement. And you could also use a calibration target. So with ultrasonic sensors, we have a calibration target that uh, you put in the flume. You set it to a known height. Um, in this case, the, the example is showing uh, three feet. And so you'd have your target mounted at the, in your flume. The ultrasonic sensor would read the the distance and the uh, and what the level would be at the uh, target, and then you would calibrate your flow meter to, in this example, three feet. So it's a nice, easy way to do it, and you don't have to worry about the velocity going through, and you know you have a fixed depth that you're calibrating to. Uh, another good idea is to use the ISCO flow data handbook or the manufacturer's lookup table. And so with that, you would look at the height or depth, water depth and then uh, find out the associated flow rate and your flow meter should match that. Other types of flumes are the Palmer bolus flume. Uh, so this is a little bit different. It, uh, <clears throat> the water goes through the flume. We're concerned about the water going over the top of the flume. But what, we're, what makes this different is that it has that upper transition. And so we where we have the arrow pointing to the zero point. So at the top of that uh, upper transition is the zero flow. So that's where 
we want to uh, calibrate the level from the zero point up to the water surface. So when doing this, you would measure the overall depth where the red arrow is at and then subtract the upper transition. So you want to pay attention to the offset and the way you can figure that out, that offset, the uh, formula is the diameter of the Palmer bolus flume divided by six. So in this example, we have a six inch Palmer bolus flume divided by six. The upper transition is one inch. Now you should con uh, uh, reference your manufacturer's um, flow data table. Uh, ISCO has a flow data table, but um, if you're using a, you know, other vendors, their uh, flow calculations may be slightly different uh, just due to the way they built the flume. Uh, one, another question that came in about Palmer Bolus's fl flumes is the uh, maintenance. They had noticed that they were always getting sediment on the upstream side by that uh, upper transition. So that's kind of the give and take of a Palmer Bolus flume. The advantage is, is that uh, a lot of times you can insert them into an existing pipe. But because of that uh, riser, that uh, upward transition, you can and will get sediment uh, uh, build up in front of it. So you do need to schedule a, have a maintenance schedule to go out there and clean that periodically. A couple tips I've seen when I've been out in the field with the technicians uh, when they're taking level measurements is they will use uh, chalk or powder, put that on their ruler or stick put that in, in the water and then it's going to uh, wash off you know, where the water is and then you just measure up to where the remaining chalk is. Uh, one I recently saw that I liked is they use washable markers. So they had a, a metal uh, ruler or stick that they put in there and they used the uh, washable marker, put it on there and the same thing, the water washed off the marker, you just measured up to where your ink was at and that was your, your level. Uh, nice easy way to do it but it's less messy than using chalk. Another option, uh, especially if you have high velocity, is to measure from the top of the pipe. So in this example, what we do is I would measure the ID of the pipe. In this case, it's 12 inches. We would have six inches of air space. So I'd take 12 mi minus six, and then that gives me six inches of water depth. So I would then calibrate my level to six inches. This comes in really handy if you have high velocity because if you put a ruler in an application that has like five foot per second velocity going through there, it's gonna rise up on your ruler and it's gonna be difficult to get an accurate level reading because it's gonna rise up on the ruler anywhere from a quarter inch to uh, one or two inches. And it's, you know, then at that point, it's just kind of guesswork as to what the actual level is. So this approach may be more accurate for you. So calculating flow with the primary device, it uh, requires a level to flow equation. Uh, there are common level sensors that are used with the weirs and flumes. You can use an ultrasonic sensor, which is non-contact uh, mounted above your flow stream, so you don't have to worry about uh, debris getting caught in the sensor. There are radar level sensors that uh, also mount above your flow stream. Or you can use a pressure transducer Pressure transducer is mounted on the bottom of your channel. Uh, when you order a flume, you just tell your vendor uh, what type of technology you plan on using, and they will usually uh, can usually accommodate you to set up the appropriate uh, level technology to work with it. And you can also use a bubbler. So a bubbler, the way that operates, measures the amount of pressure it takes to push out uh, one bubble at the end of that bubble line, which would be equivalent to the water depth. So what are some of the challenges with uh, flow monitoring? Uh, debris in the channel, uh, maintenance, and installing uh, sensors in high flow. So what I mean by like difficult, difficult application, uh, it's that it could be net, uh, a channel that occasionally surcharges. Uh, it might not be practical to install a flume because it's just a difficult location or it's too expensive to install a flume. So some of your options are to install a non-contact area velocity flow meter, such as the laser flow, or you could uh, offset an in-pipe area velocity sensor to the side of the channel, which I'll show you. But first, the laser flow sensor, the way that operates, it's gonna mount above your flow stream. 
It uses an ultrasonic sensor to read the distance to the surface of the water. When we know the distance, now the laser will focus below the surface of the water. The laser's on for about two seconds and takes 5,000 spectral readings to get a, uh, our velocity. The other option was to offset the sensor in the pipe. So if you have an in-pipe area velocity sensor, traditionally you're going to uh, put it at the six o'clock position on the bottom of the pipe. But if you have issues with sediment or debris collecting on that sensor, well, then it becomes a lot of maintenance. So what you can do, take the sensor, offset it to the side of the pipe, and then you would calibrate your level. So in this uh, picture, if that was six inches of uh, water depth and the sensor was at the bottom of the pipe, I would calibrate my level to six inches. If I rotate it up to the side of the pipe, now I'm uh, two inches off the bottom, I would still calibrate my level to six inches because that's the actual water depth. And this is just an example where they had uh, two sensors in a, in a channel. They were getting sediment on there, rotated off to the side, and we're getting uh, great data after that. Other questions I get are, um, how much straight run of pipe or channel do I need for installing an area velocity sensor? Well, the biggest thing is you need uniform flow. Because um, we're taking a uh, velocity reading and without uniform flow, it's going to be difficult to get accurate uh, flow readings. So the rule of thumb is that uh, depending on who you ask, it's uh, we'd like to see at least five diameters upstream, excuse me, uh, 10 upstream and five down. Uh, other people you ask are going to say five up, two down. Really, it's uh, specific to the application. You have to look at the application and determine what is upstream. Um, you know, do we have pumps or bends? Um, is the how fast is the velocity? Uh, because th with the faster velocity, we need more straight runs. We have uh, something you know like a bend or a pump upstream. It's going to create more turbulence. And the idea is we want to make sure we have uniform flow before it uh, goes across or underneath your area velocity sensor. All right, another question that came in is, uh, how do I put together a complete scope that includes all the required cables and connectors? Uh, for example, they have a ISCO 2150EX with the 2194EX. Uh, so with that, I would, uh, uh, you can go to the ISCO website and download the 2150EX manual, and they have this uh, example in there just showing all the parts and uh, cables, how it goes together. The main thing is the 2150EX is in the hazardous area. We have a network cable that goes over to the, um, essentially the network isolator, which is our 2194EX barrier. Um, and with that, then we can uh, power it with the uh, AC to DC power pack, solar panels, batteries. Uh, so as long as we're in a safe area, then we can use all the traditional options for powering the equipment. Another question was, uh, I'd like to build a, a guide for flow characteristics to determine which technology should I use. That's the, there's a lot of things to take into consideration for that. Um, some of the things I start to ask first is, uh, is it safe to install that equipment in the pipe? Do you need to read reverse flow? Is this an application that's tidally influenced that maybe have uh, reverse flow in there? Is sediment or debris an issue? So before deploying equipment, I like to ask them to go out, look at the site, look at the, the, uh, you know, the ladder rungs, other things around there for signs of uh, surcharging. And then how long is the study? So, you know, if you're only going to be out there for, uh, you know, 10 minutes doing a spot check, uh, you know, then we're not so worried about the sediment or surcharging because you're out there on site. So the answers to these are going to determine, you know, what technology do I use? Uh, if I'm going to use an in-pipe area velocity sensor or if I need to use a non-contact one because there's surcharging, um, the duration of the study, uh, it will determine if I uh, need AC power or solar panels or batteries when I go out there, uh, or possibly even using a, a modem. If it's a location that's difficult to get to, you may want to consider using a modem. That way you can monitor the site remotely. Um, if it's a short study, like you're only going to be out there spot checking, uh, we have a, a metering insert, which is a, uh, a small weir with an inner tube 
uh, around it, slides in the pipe, restricts the flow, and then it uh, uses the level over the weir to calculate the flow. Uh, it's a great option for uh, short studies and spot checking. Another question was, uh, um, yeah, can you go over or provide information about uh, case studies using AV sensors? Um, monitors develop a rating curve for, so you, what they want to do is they want to develop a rating curve by using an area velocity sensor. Uh, I do not have a case study on that, but I have worked with uh, people over the years on this, and what they've done is they've taken an area velocity sensor, put it in the channel, let it run for, you know, a day or a week to get a nice uh, uh, flow curve. And so what I've done with the uh, ISCO flow link software, now I've taken the level and the flow rate, and as you can see in this example, the level and flow changed quite a bit over this uh, three-day study. And then I was able to export the level and flow rate to develop a flow table. So I just uh, exported all that, I sorted it, and then now I have the option to uh, you know pick however many level to flow rate uh, data points that I want to use. So uh, continuing on that, how can you use the level only to calculate flow? One, you can just use a uh, level to flow rate table. So the ISCO flow, ISCO flow data handbook has lots of tables in there, depending on what your application is. Um, or you can use a flow calculation to determine your flow rate. Uh, other options are using the Manning formula. So if you have a round pipe, elliptical, rectangular channel, you need to know the slope of the pipe, which will calculate, it's part of the velocity calculation, and you need to know the roughness. So with the slope and the roughness, then you can, fig you can uh, use the level to calibrate, calibrate your flow. Now this is making the assumption that you have a free flow application. Uh, the difficult part is trying to figure out what your roughness is. Um, in these examples, uh, you know, we have a concrete channel, but there's still some vegetation in there, so it, it makes it a little more difficult to figure out what your roughness coefficient is. Another question was, uh, could you tell us something about Doppler sensor calibration? So first, when using an area velocity sensor, uh, the formula is area times velocity to get our flow. So what do we need? We need a level. We need to know what the pipe geometry is. So we need to know that it's a round pipe or rectangular or elliptical. We need to measure the water depth. So when we know the water depth, we can calculate what the wetted cross-sectional area is in that pipe. And next, we need the average velocity. So when we have the average velocity and then the wetted area, we can now calculate the flow rate. So with the area velocity sensors like the ISCO uh, in-pipe AV sensors, we use um, a Doppler to read the velocity. And so we output a 500 kilohertz signal and uh, read the frequency shift. And so what is a Doppler effect, as we're shown here with this ambulance, is that uh, it transmits a sound, in our case, 500 kilohertz signal, and then it um, reads the uh, frequency shift back to the sensor. So as the sound or particles are moving towards uh, the sensor, you're gonna get a higher frequency, and as it moves away, it, uh, it uh, reads a lower frequency. Another example of that is we have our AV sensor in the, in the pipe, with the pressure transducer to read the depth of the water. It fires a 500 kilohertz signal, bounces off all the uh, particles, the air bubbles in the water to give us an average velocity uh, from that frequency shift. But the question was, uh, you know, how do we calibrate uh, vo velocity on an AV sensor? Uh, the velocity uh, calibration is not required because it is just a, it's, the theory behind the frequency shift, we can uh, calculate the accurate velocity on it uh, based off the frequency shift. So it doesn't really matter if I'm outputting a one megahertz signal or a 500 kilohertz signal. It, uh, you know, it, it's reading the Doppler effect or the frequency shift to come up with the velocity. But if you insist on calibrating because it doesn't match another flow meter, historical data, uh, it, it doesn't match. It's one of my favorites when they say for five years I've been getting the exact same flow rate and it doesn't match that. 
find that hard to believe sometimes. But uh, or if they just say the flow rate doesn't look right, um, and it or it doesn't match my influent flow. There are some options. So with the ISCO Signature 350 Area Velocity Sensor and the Laser Flow Sensor in the advanced programming, uh, we have a velocity coefficient. It's going to be labeled under coefficient B. And so if you have an offset that you want to put in there, that is where we, we can enter that offset. Or in, afterwards in the FlowLink software, we can uh, uh, apply a coefficient to it to adjust the velocity and recalculate your flow rate. Another question was, can I use an AV sensor in a full pipe for flow rate calculations? Yes, um, it worked well for that. Uh, so at that point, uh, the flow rate is proportional to velocity in a full pipe, similar to a mag meter. So before we used level to calculate area, but uh, now it's full, we get 100% area. Uh, the advantage of an AV sensor is it can read reverse flow as well as mag meters can read, read forward and reverse flow in a full pipe. Uh, so their <clears throat> the AV sensor is ideal for surcharge applications, tidally influenced pipes that are, you know, for the most part uh, non-full, but then they would occasionally go full when you get reverse flow. Uh, <clears throat> some AV sensors, area velocity sensors, have temp temperature sensors built in. Uh, What's nice about that, and I recommend that you uh, log the temperature, because if, you if you're if you doing an I and I study and your flow rates change and you see that the temperature starts to drop, that's an indication that you're getting rainfall in your pipe because you're gonna see the water, the temperature drop uh, as your flow rates are changing due to um, rainfall coming in. Um, another option for uh, calibrating AV sensors, like the uh, ISCO, uh, sensors, they are temperature calibrated, and so the advantage of, the, of that is you can take that sensor, calibrate it to zero level in open air, and then install it in, in your channel. I've found, especially on high, higher velocity applications, this ends up being more accurate than trying to put a ruler in the water and measuring, you know, because the how the water uh, rises up on the on the ruler, it makes it difficult to get an accurate level reading. And as far as the uh, our sensors being temperature calibrated, uh, the idea behind this is to avoid uh, drift due to compensation. So um, sensors that don't have it uh, would require you to take the sensor, put it in the water for five to 10 minutes to let it acclimate to the water temperature and, and then calibrate your level. If you didn't do this, then you put it in, you would actually see a level shift due to the temperature. More questions on the AV sensors. Um, Somebody is having, when it's in troubleshooting help on how to read negative uh, flows and if there's any way, creative ways to test your sensor. So what we, our uh, technicians have come up with is they've used a, an aquarium air stone and they put it in the bottom of a tube. So as you're seeing here, we got a, like a four inch or six inch PVC tube. They put an aquarium air stone in the bottom of it and then the AV sensor will read the speed of the bubbles coming up to the surface. They rise at a rate of about a foot per second. It kind of depends how close you are to the uh, air stone. But for re reading reverse flow, just turn the sensor upside down so it's facing the ceiling, and you should be able to read the air bubbles uh, going away from it. So this is a pretty inexpensive way to um, test your area velocity sensors without having to build a big flow loop. Other ways to... Uh, uh, measure reverse flow or determine the quality of your uh, area velocity sensors like with the uh, uh, 2150 and the 350 AV sensors. Uh, we have diagnostics built in for signal strength, uh, measures the amount of reflected energy received. Uh, it's an indication of the gain applied to the signal. Uh, a lot of times you're going to see this in the you know, around the 60 percent range. Uh, the spectrum strength is the return signal from the uh, signal that's been sent, sent out. Uh, it's an indication of the true velocity versus the uh, noise. And then last, the spectrum ratio that tells us um, the direction of the flow. So example of that spectrum ratio, in this case, you would see all the waters go in one direction, you should get 100% uh, ratio indicating all the waters go in one direction. But if you see something like this where the water is swirling, 
um, then you're going to have a, a lower ratio, which could be down to zero if it's seeing equal positive and negative velocity. This is helpful when you have an application that uh, is starting to get uh, dropouts on velocity where it was working fine and then now we get a poor ratio and possibly negative velocities. Well, if there's debris in front of the sensor, it could create that swirling and that could uh, be an indication you need to send somebody out there to clean that, that channel. So you can be proactive with this and you see the ratios start to drop and your spectrum start uh, lowering, you know, send a technician out to clean it before it gets completely covered. Um, other questions that came in uh, are about the laser flow sensor. I want to uh, discuss the initial and flow on calibration to maintain accuracy. Uh, what's required for routine uh, routine basis, how often, uh, and discuss the Doppler power. Um, the minimum suggested uh, Doppler power is uh, 1,000, and discuss the accuracy. So as far as um, when you install a, a laser flow sensor, uh, the only calibration required for that is the level, the depth calibration. Um, we, If it's difficult to get into the pipe, we can uh, use the distance, so the laser flow sensor will automatically uh, tell you what the distance from the bottom of the laser is to the, to, the, to the water surface. But what I recommend is when you install the laser, take a physical measurement of the bottom of the laser to the bottom of the channel. And then now when we have the distance reading from the sensor itself, we just subtract the distance from the overall distance to the bottom of the channel. What's left over is going to be your level. Now, as far as the uh, calibration frequency, um, it, it's really site-specific, and a lot of it is driven uh, by local regulations on how often you have to do that, or just your standard operating procedures. Um, now, with that said, if just talking to people all over the country, uh, a lot of times they'll go out two to four times a year to do level calibrations. So they go out and just check the application, calibrate, or verify that the level is still reading properly. The other question was the uh, discuss the minimum Dopplers to assure accuracy. Uh, by default, it's uh, the equipment set to uh, 1,000 for minimum Doppler. Um, and so what that does is it provides an adequate uh, signal to noise ratio to make sure we're getting a good uh, return signal. So as you can see with that uh, graph on the bottom right, the Doppler power is calculated off the entire area underneath that curve. So you see that curve A, that is built by the 5,000 uh, spectral readings that are taken when the laser's on for uh, two seconds. And so the Doppler power reading that you're going to see is going to be dependent on the turbidity of the water. Uh, so the dirtier the water, you, the higher the uh, Doppler signal you're going to see, the uh, cleaner the water, the Doppler power is going to uh, decrease. It doesn't mean that it's a better or worse reading, it just means that uh, we have more or less particles in the water. And then the distance away from the water is going to have an effect on that Doppler power reading. Uh, but what we're looking for is we just want the Doppler power to be higher than the noise level. So uh, in this uh, example on that bottom right, C, that's just the electronic noise level. We just want to make sure that we have a higher signal um, than the, uh, the noise so we get at accurate flow readings or velocity readings. Another question came in is discuss the accuracy of uh, flow rates under the minimum 0.5 foot per second. Uh, so as far as our uh, testing and verification has all been done down to 5 foot per second, uh, I do not have accuracy specs below that. Um, however, uh, we have had lots of applications that have read velocities uh, slower than that, you know, down all the way down to 0.15 foot per second. Uh, as far as you know, th those readings, they uh, um, they look accurate. Uh, my, the customers I've dealt with have, have also thought that was an accurate reading. Um, you know, you'd have to do some independent testing with the, you know, bucket and stopwatch or something. Or if you have that slow of velocity, you, you probably can do that. <clears throat> All right, now that it's colder out, uh, I've had several questions coming in about uh, cold weather. And uh, this person is having problems with the, uh, they're getting like ghosting uh, with their ultrasonic sensor. 
uh, when it's cold out. Um, they were asking about the cleaning the face of it. So yes, cleaning the water droplets off the face of the sensor could help. So if it's mounted in a vertical orientation uh, with colder weather, sometimes we get uh, steam coming up, you get water droplets developing on the uh, face of the ultrasonic transducer. The uh, water droplets can freeze and then that could uh, cause some, pr some problems. Uh, so one thing you can do is we sell a horizontal mounting bracket and so if you mount it horizontal, now those water droplets should go to the bottom of it and uh, stay away from the face of the transducer. So that could help minimize that problem. All right, for the portable samplers, uh, the question is, is the 750 module uh, better, a better solution than strictly ultrasonic um, when they have flow conditions 50 to 250 gallons per hour? Kind of depends on the application. You know, if you already have a flume in place or if the debris is an issue, um, you know, flumes are, you know, highly accurate, been used for a long time. Uh, so, you know, the ultrasonic uh, may be a better option. But, uh, you know, there's, but if it, you have a flume application and you, it's been known to surcharge, um, you know, the using level only would, would not be, ideal because uh, the flume is assuming um, or expects the flow to go one direction, so it would not be able to read reverse flow. So in that case, an area velocity sensor like the 750 would be better. Um, one thing you'd have to take into consideration, um, so I know we have the flow rate, but I don't know what size channel that is, um, but we need at least one inch of uh, water to cover the sensor to be able to get a velocity reading. With the 750 sensor, the velocity should be greater than a half foot per second. And uh, another thing to just watch out for is that if you do have really slow velocity, um, you know, below two foot per second, you're going to start getting sediment and stuff dropping out of the flow stream, which could uh, eventually cover the sensor. So other options for that, especially if you have the slow velocity, is put, use the laser flow sensor. It's going to be non-contact. We don't have to worry about debris collecting on it. Other options is, uh, depending on the channel, put a Palmer bolus insert in. And then you can continue to use your ultrasonic sensor um, or uh, consider using a, a, a 730 bubbler. Um, so I need a little more information uh, on this application to, to better answer that. But the nice thing about the bubbler, if you did have issues with steam or foam, uh, the bubbler would not be affected by those. So, how do you control the interference of steam or ice buildup on, on uh, meters exposed to elements? Our facility has a few flow meters that echoes under these conditions. Uh, if you have the ultrasonic sensor, you could try setting the blanking distance on it. The default range is zero to 10 feet. You could set that a little bit closer. So if it's getting stray echoes, it could uh, filter or ignore the outside echoes. Um, I've had people uh, vent the manhole to, uh, you know, they, instead of a solid manhole cover, have it with the um, grooves or vents in it to allow the steam to escape. Uh, other options would be to go with a, a, a bubbler level system um, because the bubbler would not be affected by uh, wind or steam or uh, foam on top of the surface. And uh, another possibility is using a, a radar level sensor because the uh, radar sensor would be able to penetrate the steam and foam. A similar question is they'd like to uh, monitor the level outdoors in a weir box in freezing fine weather in Minnesota. Uh, what's a good non-contact uh, solution for de detecting ice, ice level or water level in the weir box? Um, so yeah, our options are kind of limited here. I know you mentioned you wanted to use a non-contact, but a bubbler uh, may be a good option for that. We have a like a four-foot stainless steel bubble tube that you could uh, put down the side of that channel. So, um, uh, you know, the, the surface of it is a uh, you know small, so it's uh, not likely to collect uh, rags or other thing on it. Um, or you just have to take a manual readings. You know, have a staff gauge installed on the side of the the wall, and somebody would have to go out there and take a look at it. Um, you know, other non-contact options would be the ultrasonic level sensor or possibly a radar level sensor. Next question is customer that's uh, currently using the laser flow area velocity flow meter 
Uh, under no normal flow conditions, they get 6 to 15 MGD. Under heavy flow conditions, they are developing foam on top, uh, top of the water, uh, which could create problems because the ultrasonic or the laser flow sensor uses the ultrasonic uh, sensor for level, and if it cannot penetrate the uh, foam, uh, it's going to go into error. So an option for that is that you could install one, use the bubbler again, or use a radar level sensor, and then with the signature flow meter, we could have it switch over to the other technology. So what we could do is develop a uh, flow rating curve, level to flow curve off of the uh, laser flow sensor, and then we could switch over to using the level of the uh, uh, bubbler or radar sensor uh, when you do have the heavy foaming conditions. All right, uh, we've had a few more questions come in, and so give me just a second and we'll get to those. So one of the questions that came in was about the uh, laser flow sensor located several hundred feet upstream from a weir. Uh, assume the flow rate is still calculated area velocity. So yeah, it does depend. Yeah, if it's several hundred feet upstream, it probably isn't uh, affected, you know, by the weir, uh, you know, so as far as the, the velocity is going to be slowed down a little bit. But at, at that point, you're still getting a free flow free flow through there. So the area velocity formula should still work on that. If it was closer to the weir, um, where we essentially had dead space, you know, dead water because of that weir wall, you know, then we would have to take into account for that. And uh, what I've done in applications where the laser happened to be closer, is uh, we were able to program in a silt level to uh, essentially uh, remove that uh, uh, wetted area that uh, where the water isn't flowing. All right, another question is, uh, how does the laser flow meter account for varying flow velocities in a pipe when uh, calculating flow? What areas in the pipe does the laser cover and how deep? Well, as far as the uh, varying flow rates, the laser flow is reading the uh, uh, just below the surface of the water because what we're looking for is the peak velocity, which is below the surface. So as your uh, uh, water depth changes, the flow rates change, the peak velocity still remains just below the surface where we're reading the velocity to then calculate an average velocity. Um, and as far as uh, the other part of that question is how deep does the laser uh, penetrate below the surface of the water, uh, we have the option to set it to read at uh, 5%, 8%, and 11% below the surface of the water. So as the water depth changes, it looks at the depth and then does calculation at 5, 8, and 11% with a maximum uh, focus depth of 6 inches below the surface of the water. Um, another question was, uh, what is the maximum distance from the from the water for the laser meter to uh, measure accurately? Uh, we can uh, mount the laser flow sensor up to 10 feet away from the water to be able to read the level and velocity. Another question was, uh, what's the possibility of adding an AV sensor to the laser flow and have an average or switching option? And what does the AV sensor use for depth? Um, so yeah, we can add an area velocity sensor. We can either put it on the bottom of the laser flow sensor, and we use that as, we call it our surcharge sensor, or we have the ability to put a uh, AV sensor in the, in the channel. Um, and with the signature meter, we could use uh, we could use both velocities and average them to calculate a flow if you wanted to, or we can set a trigger in there so that it, uh, when you get to a certain water depth or flow rate, we can uh, automatically have it switch from the AV sensor or to the laser flow sensor. Uh, so we do have a lot of flexibility with our programming to be able to do that. And the other part of that question is on the AV sensor, what is it used for depth? Uh, it has a uh, differential pressure transducer that has a range uh, up, you know, zero up to 10 feet. Uh, 
another question came in uh, with regards to the base of the channel when using a laser flow meter. Uh, the client <clears throat> has a lot of debris uh, that's difficult to remove from the bottom of the channel. That uh, <clears throat> that's uh, difficult to measure because uh, we you do not have uniform flow going through that channel. So when it uh, any area velocity meter it reads that uh, velocity and it expects to have uniform flow going through there. In this case, it does not. <clears throat> so it, it uh, uh, with that application, you would get uh, trending, uh, you know, during your storm events and normal flow. But it would be difficult to get a, a real accurate flow reading through there. So they would have to, they would have to go in and clear that debris out. Uh, some other technologies like the uh, uh, our older uh, ADFM acoustic Doppler flow, flow meters that automatically profile the flow stream might work better in that application because they would be able to read the uh, uh, different velocities throughout the channel. But uh, at the end of the day, my recommendation would be to get something in there, clean it out to get accurate flows. Uh, another question is somebody was looking for a calibration certificate on the AV sensor. Uh, contact ISCO customer service, get the serial number off that area velocity sensor, and uh, and we can get the calibration certificate for that. Let's see, would it be possible for the laser flow to see the pressure differential and use it as opposed to the sonar? Uh, no. Uh, as far as the laser flow sensor, uh, just by design, it's uh, it, it's using the ultrasonic distance. That's the key thing. It's using the distance uh, from the bottom of the laser to the top of the water to determine where it needs to uh, focus. Um, then the second part of that question is, uh, yeah, they, they have foaming. Um, so yeah, that would be one where you know we may want to use two different technologies and just uh, switch between them if uh, foam is an issue. Or try to resolve the foaming, you know, by getting some type of a sprayer or something, you know, upstream to knock down the foam. Well, I do want to thank everyone for their time today. Uh, we had a lot of great questions coming in. Uh, looks like we're about out of questions. If other questions do come up, uh, you can email us um, on your invitation. It had an email address on there. Um, or you can uh, email me. It's on the screen at uh, daryl.cuda at teledyne.com. I'd be happy to answer your questions. Or feel free to uh, call, call the factory at any time, um, and uh, we'd be happy to help you. Thank you all for attending our webinar today, and thank you to Daryl for presenting this topic. It, as mentioned earlier, it will be recorded and a video will be made available. If you have further questions, feel free to reach out to me and I will direct it to the correct person. Thank you again and have a great day.